All right, welcome back, everyone. Here we go, D-Day, June 6, 1944. So this is, of all the lectures I do in my World War II series, I think the one that I'm most passionate about, I love lecturing on everything World War II. The last one you should have watched was the Battle of the Atlantic. Um, and for me, you know, the D-Day story is so vital and so important to understand. And, you know, I have to say I've been to Normandy and, you know, I tell this to all my students before I even get into this material is when I first went there, my plan was to go to Normandy, take some pictures, get an idea of the area so I could better come come back and, and, and lecture my students better on it. And it kind of started as this kind of historical journey. By the time I was done visiting the beaches, visiting the cemetery, it feels like you go through a pilgrimage. And it is that type of a powerful event in your life. And so I really hope if anybody does ever get a chance to go to Europe, go to France, you know, people go to Paris, you know, Paris is great. Go to D-Day, go to Normandy, uh, because there's just so much to see there. And it's such a vital uh, part of understanding American history and the history of Western civilization in the world. So what's going on here? The Battle of the Atlantic was over or is winding down, and now we can launch this D-Day invasion. And so let's look at our first map. There's gonna be a lot of images and maps I'm gonna show you in this lecture. And as always, you're getting all this key words and information down. So when you look at the beaches, there are five landing beaches at Normandy. I didn't put them all up as keywords, but they're all up there on this image. So please make sure you get them all down. Utah, Omaha, Gold, Juno, and Sword. You need to know all five of them for my class. And it was on these beaches on June 6, 1944, that you're going to see one of the most massive invasions in human history. There will be over 2 million men who will eventually be part of this, 500,000 military vehicles that will be part of this um, invasion. And, you know, there's a lot to talk about. And even though this is going to be longer than all my other lectures on World War II here from the series, uh, it is going to be a little bit longer. Even here, I'm not going to be able to talk about everything, but at least you'll get a feel of what this was all about. And very common, the first thing people think about with a D-Day invasion is they envision a movie like Saving Private Ryan, which is a great movie if you haven't seen it, and the landing on the beaches. And that's what people usually associate with D-Day for good reason, right? The landing on the beaches. But as I walk students through the story, it didn't start from the land. It actually started from the air. And the first stage of the D-Day invasion actually comes from the paratroopers and the drop zones and C-47s and what is this Engleville place I'm going to talk about in a second. So the way this is going to work is, remember, you're launching this massive invasion from England, right, into the northern part of France. And the allies who were orchestrating all of this understood that the moment you start to put massive number of forces, right, into the beaches, the Germans, who remember the Germans control the northern part of France at this point, right? They've had this area since the Battle of France in 1940. They're going to start bringing their reinforcements up to the north, right, wherever it is. And so one of the key things to do in terms of making sure the D-Day invasion went well is you had to get soldiers in deeper inside of the territory and so that and i'll tell you why they're doing that in a second but the point is that they had to have these paratroopers um and these paratroopers came from the 101st and 82nd airborne and they would land in these drop zones and you could see kind of one of these drop zones here you can see 82nd 101st airborne and you could see these drop zones that they would land on now a drop zone, you know, I use this for, for my students at Cypress College, is, is fairly big. It's a drop zone is almost the size of what would be our community college, Cypress College. It's, it's about, you know, one mile by a quarter mile in size roughly, or one mile by a half mile in size. So it's a big chunk of area. And these paratroopers would get on these planes, these C-47 planes. I'm going to show you a picture of the C-47 in a minute. And they would drop into these um, areas. Now, why are they doing this? Why do we have to get paratroopers inside of this region before you can actually do a land invasion? Well, because these paratroopers have a job. Their job is to land and then to, you know, if there are roads that are going up north or rail lines that are going up north, they've got to stop those roads and rail lines and whatever it is, bridges, to, to enforce those so the Germans can't bring more reinforcements up there. 
And dropping these drop zones was incredibly dangerous. Obviously, you've got Germans shooting at you. The, one of the things the Germans did would flood the low-lying areas. So when a, a paratrooper landed, you know, you've got your gear. You've got probably like 50 pounds of gear on you. You've got, you know, your parachute and you drop. And if you're landing in even what is four or five feet of water, you could easily drown. And we lost a lot of boys just drowning as they were jumping out of these planes. Um, so that's how D-Day started. It didn't start from the land. It actually started from the air. Um, one of the most interesting things to see is, first of all, let me show you a picture of the C-47. So this is a C-47. This is what a lot of the paratroopers used to jump in. And let me show you this next image I have of a church. And this is a church called Engelville. And this is a place I went to visit, just a picture I happened to take when I was there. And <laughs> You know, most people have never heard of this place, never heard of this church, but it, to me, it's a very meaningful place. And the reason was, is in Normandy, and there are a lot of churches in northern France, in Normandy, right? The northern part of France, Normandy. And during the fighting between the Allies and the Germans, there was a lot of casualties, and these churches often were used as Red Cross shelters. Um, I've been into this Angleville church. You walk in, you look at the, the wooden pews, and you still see the blood soaked into the chairs and the benches there uh, all the way back to the time of World War II. The blood is still there. And, you know, this all the fighting took place there, and it was very intense. And if you remember from one of my earlier lectures, when I talked about the Battle of France, I, you know, I was very critical about the French for, like, releasing Nazi collaborators like people pop, like Papon. But I also mentioned that despite that, there's still a lot of people to this day who are very grateful to what the United States did during World War II. And one of the most stunning images I've ever seen in my life is an image I saw inside this church, and it's this image. And for those of you who recognize, I actually use this image as a, my profile image for my, for my YouTube channel even, because it's so meaningful to me. This is in a church, right? And what you're looking at is a stained glass mirror window of a paratrooper, an American paratrooper landing in Normandy. Now, if you ever go to a church, this is not the type of image you would typically see in a normal church, right? But if you go through France, in the northern part of France, a lot of the windows and mirror windows were destroyed, if you think about it, and all the fighting just blew up, so they had to rebuild them. And to honor the American paratroopers in church after church, they created these stained glass with images like this one. And to me, this is such so important because, you know, if you think about it, you know, 50 years, 100 years, two, 300 years from now, somebody's going to walk into this church and they're going to see the stained glass window and they're going to wonder why, why is that there? And somebody's going to have to be able to know the history and be able to say, hey, that's because back in 1944, Americans risked their lives to free this area of France and much of the rest of Europe. So to me, a, a memorial like this is so powerful and moving. And so definitely, I always like sharing this with everybody, you know, my students and everything. So that's the Angleville Church. All right. So meanwhile, you know, we've got paratroopers landing, right? The paratroopers are landing. They're trying to, to hold off the Germans. And now you need to get to this landing. Now, the four years, remember, basically since June 1940, Battle of France till 1944, the French have had, the Germans have had four years to build up what we call these resistance nests. And they were all along the northern coast of France, right? These resistance nests were what the Germans had built. I'm going to show you some pictures. I've been to those sites as well. Of, of bunkers, right? These massive bunkers, and I'll show you a picture of it in a second. And they would be all along the coastal area there. And the way this would work is you'd have a resistance nest, and each resistance nest might be, you know, a few hundred uh, feet by a few hundred feet, right? So you can kind of imagine along the coast. And I'll show you some pictures of this better. And they would have these bunkers, and these bunkers would then be able to shoot out guns, 88 millimeter guns, out into the coast in all sorts of directions, right? And so if there's a force coming to you, you know, an allied force coming against you, if you're the Nazis, you've got these resistance nests firing barrages of bullets right into the sea, um, into the English Channel there, and it would obviously right there make it incredibly difficult just to get your boats into land. 
So these resistance nests were a serious uh, uh, problem for a D-Day invasion. So first you've got the land invasion. I'm sorry, the paratroopers, they're coming in. But before you could do the, the amphibious attack on the beaches, you got to figure out what to do with these bunkers. Now, I'm not going to talk about all the bunkers, but I do want to talk about a couple, one of them in particular. Um, so this is just, first of all, an image of one of the bunkers that I went at a place called Point de Hoc, which I'm going to talk about in a second. 88 millimeter guns. Like I said, they could fire distances of up to 14 miles away. And, you know, this is a I, I purposely wanted a picture of somebody here just to get a sense of, you know, the, the size of this thing. Right. You know how big these bunkers are. Uh, and mind you, you know, there's going to be bombardments, aerial bombardments on these bunkers before D-Day happens. And so what we did is before we can even launch the D-Day, we bomb these uh, aerial, the, the, the bunkers at places like Point de Hoc. So this is an aerial view of Point de Hoc, right? If you're not familiar with it, it's a very strategic place. It's between two of the key beaches of Omaha in Utah Beach. And when you look at it from this overhead view, you see these kind of divots in the, in the ground there. What is all that? That's all the aerial bombardments that we did before D-Day. Um, I believe it's estimated we dropped about 10 kilotons of bombs on Point de Hoc. 10 kiloton is massive. 10 kiloton is like an obscene, massive explosion. We didn't do that at one time. It was a series of bombs that we dropped, but they were definitely something we did in order to, to try to weaken the bunkers there as much as possible. Look at the damage. Um, so this is a close-up of the... The, the the craters that were created and these were pictures I took uh, apparently back if you go back to 1944 the craters were like twice as deep uh, because they filled up over the years so you can imagine the craters even being much deeper there at Point de Hoc and this is just some of the rubble that remained there that they just kind of left for people to go and visit and look at so what happens is we bomb this area but again Point de Hoc was such an important strategic location that we wanted to make sure the German resistance nests were really completely taken out there. So this next story of D-Day is just amazing. And it's the story of the boys of Point de Hoc. Um, and if you're not familiar with this story, let me share it to you real briefly here. So there were American Rangers whose job was on the morning of D-Day to go ahead of everybody else, get to Point de Hoc, and their job was to climb up these cliffs. These cliffs that you could see in this image are like 90 degrees and a couple, you know, several, a couple hundred, two, three hundred feet up. And they have to climb up these cliffs and they have to make sure that the resistance nests that point to Hawk are taken out. And they did, they climbed, but as they were climbing up, the Germans, they were fighting them, they were throwing, you know, um, grenades at them, they were cut, and the way they got up is they would shoot rope ladders up. So the, the Rangers would shoot rope ladders, the Germans would cut the rope ladders. So how did they get up? The, the resistance, uh, the Rangers would take their daggers, they had daggers with them, and they would shove their daggers into the cliff face, and they would start to pull themselves up these cliffs until they got to the very top, made sure that the 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 resistance nests were taken out um and so it's a very amazing story that they were up there and they fought very valiantly and a lot of those rangers died the ones that survived so this was 1944 remember 40 years later in 1984 they decided to put a memorial for those rangers at point de Hoc. And in 1984, the president of the United States at the time was Ronald Reagan. And for those of you who aren't familiar with Ronald Reagan as well, he, you know, was a very popular president of the United States. He was known of giving great speeches. And one of the things that happened is he, in 1984, on the 40th anniversary, Reagan went to this area and they invited the boys of Point de Hoc. These, you know, who were 18, 19, 20 year olds, they invited them, now they're in their 60s, 70s, to the ceremony. And I want you to kind of visualize this, these 70 year old men now sitting at a place that 40 years earlier they had to climb up and then the President of the United States is there and he gives a speech. And I just want to read to you just part of the speech of Ronald Reagan at the dedication ceremony of the, of the um, um, Memorial at Point de Hoc. This is what he says. The Rangers looked up and saw the enemy soldiers, the edge of the cliff, shooting down at them with machine guns and throwing grenades. And the American Rangers began to climb. 
They shot rope ladders over the face of these cliffs and began to pull themselves up. When one ranger fell, another would take his place. When one rope was cut, a ranger would grab another and begin his climb again. They climbed, shot back, and held their footing. Soon, one by one, the rangers pulled themselves over the top, and in seizing the firm land at the top of these cliffs, they began to seize back the continent of Europe. 225 came here. After two days of fighting, only 90 could still bear arms. Behind me is the memorial that symbolizes the rangers' daggers that were thrust into the top of these cliffs, and before me are the men who put them there. These are the boys of Point de Hook. These are the men who took the cliffs. These are the champions who helped free a continent. These are the heroes who helped end a war. And so the story of the boys of Point de Hawk is so special because, I, you know, it really does capture these young men um, who, who risked so much. And of course, we're going to see this with the rest of the D-Day invasion as well. So that's very pivotal, right? So you get the boys of Point de Hawk and, and then now we can get into the actual landing. Now, what are they facing on the beaches? Well, they're facing this on the beaches, right? They're facing these resistance nests, uh, not only on, that, on the beach itself, but on the coast. And another one of these little short stories I have in my other little playlist um, is a Batman named Sam Sachs. And if you get a chance to go and just watch that, he's a 106-year-old veteran, um, or he's 106 now, he was a veteran during World War II. He flew gliders into Normandy, and, um, and he describes kind of what it was like coming into uh, Normandy, seeing all this from above. Uh, so I do a little short lecture on him as well. It's in um, my kind of... Um, Unknown Legends of World War II series that I have. So that's something you could go and watch on your own if you want. But I wanted to show you this image as well. So now we get into the actual landing of the beaches. And there's, you know, I'm not going to talk about all the beaches. I want to focus on two of them, Utah and Omaha. So this is the beach at Utah. And, you know, I, I did, these are pictures I happen to take because I wanted, there was a strategy behind me even taking these images. And the Utah beach, you know, you could see here, you land on the beach, and after you land on the beach, you have to cross the beach, and up here you would have a German forces up, up, up on this little mound. Now, you could see the mound at Utah beach, it's not that high when you compare it to my next image I want to show you, which is Omaha beach. So very often of the five beaches, all of them were incredibly difficult, of course, but of the five, most people believe Utah was the easiest and Omaha was the hardest beach to, to take. Obviously, if you're any of these soldiers, none of these are easy beaches for you to get through. Um, but, you know, I want to give you perspective. So that's the Utah beach and this is Omaha. And you could see how much higher the cliffs are on Omaha, right? Way up high. And the other thing I want to show you, I'm going to show you a couple images. So this is an image of Omaha, and I'm taking a picture facing, you know, the, the, the end of the beach. And then on my next picture I'm going to show you here in the next slide is me facing the water. And I want to see if you can kind of put the two together. This is me facing the water. So if you add all that together and you look at it very quickly, you realize that that's a lot of beach you have to cross carrying your weapons, carrying your supplies. And if you think about it, you know, you're a 17, 18, 19 year old, you know, and a lot of people listening to this are my college students. And, you know, you, you, it's your age, guys, right? And here you are, 17, 18, 19 years old, and you're in this little boat, basically, the only thing that gives you any sort of protection. Those doors open up and you have to rush on this beach. You have to cross this massive beach with Germans shooting at you. You have to get onto the cliffs and you have to take those resistance nests. Um, and it was brutal, guys. It was bloody. It was horrific. In fact, if you look at this image where you can kind of see the the water flowing and through some of the beaches, the water recedes and flows from the, you know, high tide and low tides. Um, it was said that at the time it was so bloody that was red. Instead of water, it was red with blood. Um, and again, for those of you who've seen the movie Saving Private Ryan, they show this. And, you know, I, I've talked to people who, you know, have more expertise in military and, and, and all of that. And they say the problem with that movie, it was it was not accurate enough in terms of the brutality of it, um, how loud it was. You couldn't hear somebody next to you even because the bombardments were so loud. All you have to do is go to a gun range. If any of you have ever been to a gun range and, uh, you know, shoot, you know, it, it's loud, you know, 
you can have to multiply that exponentially and you get a sense of just the noise that was there as they were landing on the beaches. And so this is the part I really want to share kind of a bit of a little something a little personal story as I was here watching this because the next image I think is so moving to me. I'm at this beach. I'm, you know, know the history. I know what happened there. I know the story and I'm walking around this beach and then all of a sudden I just saw something and I just instinctively took a picture. And it was this. It was just this little girl, you know, six, seven years of age running on the beach. And I am never going to forget that instant when I'm looking at this and I just thought to myself, wow, she has no idea. She has no idea what happened at that beach. She's probably too young to understand that, you know, a few generations ago, you know, people gave their lives so she could be free to run on that beach. And, you know, I've sometimes wondered whatever happened to that little girl running on that beach. But, you know, it, it, people go there. It's, it's, it's just a place to go and relax today, um, even though it's such sacred ground. So I just think that's just such a uh, interesting juxtaposition of seeing this girl on a beach where you know what happened and how much brutality uh, was there at one point. All right. So now, uh, well, you know, these fighting takes place. The, eventually, the, the, the allies are able to take control of these beaches, um, but it is brutal and it is bloody. And on top of that, you see this. This is, of course, when you go on top, overlooking the beaches is the American Cemetery at D-Day. Uh, it is, you know, you see images of it. And I'll tell you, when you go and see it in person, just the row and row of graves is something that is just stays with you your entire life. You never forget it. Um, and I remember walking through this and seeing the, you know, the itch, how each cross was just so perfectly taken care of, you know, the, the, the grass there perfectly manicured. It's really well taken care of. And I thought that was very meaningful as well. And, you know, I remember just kind of walking through this and I happened to be there uh, with my aunt. And one thing I'm never going to forget is when I was there with her, she just quietly whispered to me, you know, David, they did it for us. Um, and that's something that you, we should never forget that they did do it for us. That again, if it wasn't for the people who fought at Normandy and all those, again, I talked about this earlier, no survivors. And so I think it's something always to remember. So if you get a chance to go to D-Day, it's a very important, powerful thing to go and see and do. And this is just another image. Uh, I picked this particular one also because it's got, you know, Star David as well, because that's, you know, for the Jewish soldiers who died there, which, of course, has a special meaning considering, of course, you know, what was happening in Europe at the time. Uh, one of the, the other lecture I do on Sam Sachs, the supplemental one, if you want to watch, he was a Jewish American who, who ended up liberating a camp. So you can imagine that story. Uh, if you get a chance to watch it, it's just, uh, again, very moving. And this is another part of the memorial at the D-Day beaches. This is, again, the overview. This is just the sheer number of ships and boats, and it gives you a sense of what was needed to free Europe from what the Nazis had done. Again, it'll be over 500,000 military vehicles. Millions of men are going to be part of this invasion. There are countries that don't have millions of men, and they were all part of this invasion. And this is just the Arc de Triomphe, uh, for those of you who are familiar with that, and the soldiers walking through as eventually we get to the end of the war in Europe. And um, I'll talk about the end of the war in Europe in a second, but real quick, another real, real quick story I want to talk about, another one of these unknown stories of World War II, and maybe I'll kind of do this as a separate short for people as well, something called Bletchley Park, but this is for my students. Um, so something was going on that allowed D-Day to happen. We always think of the soldiers as we should, uh, but at Bletchley Park, there was actually something incredibly secretive happening. And it was the type of thing, if you worked at Bletchley Park in World War II, you did not tell anybody what you were doing. You could be married and your spouse would not know what you were doing at Bletchley Park. Uh, what is this place? Well, very quietly in Bletchley Park, the Allies were building this, which is a computer. And this is no ordinary computer. This is the computer that was able to decode the Nazi codes, uh, which was said to have been impossible to do. But we were able to do that. We were able to actually decode the Nazi um, decryption machine 
and maybe I'll kind of do a little longer lecture on this for, for people who want to watch it. Um, and it's just an amazing story of how that was done because by being able to decrypt the Nazi codes, we're able to, you know, know Nazi troop movements and so forth, which also gave a big help fighting the D-Day beaches. There's so many other stories to the D-Day beaches. You know, Hollywood got involved. Uh, there were um, uh, false places we set up where where we were trying to convince the Germans we were going to land in one place instead of another place. Uh, so there's even much more detail to all of this, but this is all part of the story. So here again, we have our map of Europe, just kind of an overview map again. And what begins to happen is we get towards the very end of the war at the same time that the D-Day invasion is taking place, of course, from the west from the east the soviets are moving in and as we get into 1944 into 1945 of course they're squeezing everything in now there's something else happening here that's worth noting yes there's this race to to crush hitler but at the same time this is folks also the beginning of the cold war in many ways because one thing that everybody understood that roosevelt understood that churchill understood is that any of the areas that the Soviet Union gets into first are going to end up probably not having that free of a situation after. And of course, if you know much about the Cold War, Poland and all of that, you know, we see that to have been true. Um, and again, that's something we're gonna cover in future lectures when we get into the Cold War period. Uh, but there's <clears throat> two things happening. Yes, there's a race to, to, to get to free Europe, but also kind of the start of the Cold War here. And so we get to the very end here in Europe, the last kind of bit here, uh, May in 19, uh, sorry, 1945. And when we get to a few, <clears throat> 1945, a few things, April 1945, Mussolini killed. Uh, people had enough of him there. April 45, Hitler, of course, commits suicide. And then a lot of people don't realize this at the same time, FDR dies, which means Truman will become president of the United States. Um, and then shortly thereafter, May 7th, 8th, Germany surrenders, what we call VE Day, uh, victory in Europe. And so that ends the war in Europe. But of course, that's still not the end of the whole story, right? Um, from there, we still need to talk about how the war ends in the Pacific, and that's going to happen while Truman is uh, president of the United States. So there's still a little bit more on my World War II series to watch, how the war ends in the Pacific. Meanwhile, for all my students, make sure also after you watch this video, I, I put something up there in your modules about the Milgram experiment. You're definitely going to want to watch that. And just I really encourage you to watch those other supplemental lectures on, you know, Sam Sachs and the ration books that I mentioned in the previous lecture. Uh, there's, there's so much history. And again, I'd love to even spend more time on this and uh, give you even more information. But at least this series of lectures that we're doing, which again, we're going to have a little bit more of uh, when you look at the, the events and how the war ends the Pacific, are giving you at least a basic understanding of the highlights of World War II. All right. Thank you, everyone. If you have any questions on that, please let me know. Um, very important stuff. All right. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.